Hello, and welcome to the Trudy Haynes Show. I'm Trudy, and wishing you a very healthy and prosperous new year, and to invite you to join us for our first report for the new year, which includes some very important information about finding out about an orphan train, a little known part of our American history, how one organization is concerned about neglected and abused children, how you can get your children involved with the events that happen at our own Kimmel Center. And that's for free, by the way. And then we're going back in time with our own three degrees. But first, a visit with two friends who developed a business to help the elderly get help in their own homes, and at the same time, developing employment for those who help them. So let's join Teresa and Pat at Around the Clock Home Care. First of all, how long have you been in business? Well, I'd say 18 years. That's mm. a long time. Don't be scared. That's yes, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> that is a long time. How did it start? Did you two know each other? We did. We were friends. All right, but you're not relatives? No. No. And who said, let's go into business? You know, it was kind of mutual. You know, um, what do you think? I think it was. Well, we, I had done work uh, monitoring uh, home health care agencies, mm -hmm. determining how individuals felt about the services they were re receiving for the state. And Teresa had just completed her degree in nursing. I completed my degree in business administration. So we decided to put those two skills together and come up with a home health care agency where people would be able to be open about how they felt. They, could, they, they would be able to contact management. They would be able to uh, express when something was wrong or right. And we came up with them around the clock. And we realized that the uh, baby boomers were coming of age. And with that, they were uh, developing health issues. Uh, their, their status was changing. And so we said, hmm. So we selected uh, six names. We picked the three that we both liked the most. And then we polled our family and friends. And that's how we got the name Around the Clock Home Health Care. So that's what around the clock means, that you're constantly working with these people, that you're always open for their problems. 24 like that. hours a day, 365. Right. Yes. So when do you sleep? Well, <laughs> it actually means that we have people available to provide services during that time. For oh. example, a lot of agencies simply provide services during Nine, uh, to nine to six right. or eight to six. Yeah. We provide services 24 hours a day. Really? Holidays uh, as they're needed. Now what kind of services? One thing that we have to talk about. Uh, our mission is to keep our seniors at home and we provide services that will promote as much independent living as possible. Everything from standby assistance to, to uh, total care in the home. So we assist uh, our clients with personal care, um, with meal preparation, with, with, with homemaker services, housekeeping. We escort them to doctor's appointments. Uh, and the biggest issue with uh, a lot of our seniors are that people no longer live next door or around the corner, family members. They live on another coast, in, in other cities, sometimes in other countries. And they're fearful of what they read in the papers and what they hear on the news. So quite often, they don't even know who their neighbors are. So when we come into the home to provide these services, quite often that's the only point of socialization and stimulation they get during the course of the day. All of this took time. Right. You've been through several buildings. Mm -hmm. Now you're in a brand new building and just over a year ago, you celebrated your anniversary. Mm -hmm. How did you come to this gorgeous building? We first decided that we wanted to remain in Germantown. So what we did was we drove around Germantown, walked around Germantown to determine what area would we want to develop. We knew that we wanted to build a brand new building in Germantown. Did you say build? Actually, actually build from the ground up. Why? 
because one Germantown is a we, we started in Germantown second Germantown needs revitalization plus this would be the center of the service of the people who we service Germantown mm -hmm. we are based here we go out to West Philly, South Philly, Northeast, but Germantown is like the heart of it, and we decided we wanted to remain in Germantown. So that took some doing, uh, building a whole new building. It did. And you needed some kind of help. Yeah, um, we initially acquired the properties, and it was uh, three properties, and one of the properties had 36 garages that were attached to them, and then it was a small parcel of land that we had um, a name but we didn't have an address so um, we were telling our attorney about this per person particular person and when she heard the name she said I used to date him in college I will find him for you and she did and that was the final piece that starts our parking lot but uh, this was in 2007 and uh, right when it was time for us to try to get the financing the economy uh, fell apart and no one would loan any, loan any money and it took us seven years. How has your families reacted to all of the <gasps> trials and errors through the years? They've been so supportive, surprised and amazed and <laughs> we, 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 they, uh, they participated in all the uh, different mm -hmm. uh, projects that we've had. Yeah and they're, they're very proud of us. Well, of course, there were hurdles getting financing for their new location, but only one bank came to the rescue, United Bank, which Pat and Teresa will tell us about in part two of the successful rise of Around the Clock and how you can get involved. Meanwhile, I found out how you can get your children involved with events at the Kimmel Center for free. Around the clock home health care services, we decided that uh, we could play an important part in the lives of the aging population by providing services to allow them to remain in their homes and maintain a level of independence. People live longer than at home, they're happier than familiar surroundings, and that's why we're here to provide those services. We have been fortunate to have United Bank step in and assist us with the acquisition and development of construction of a two-story office. United Banks believed in Around the Clock. They believed in our vision, and they worked with us side by side to make this dream a reality. <laughs> Well, our Yanina Carter attended one of those free opportunities during the time the musical Matilda was at the Kimmel Center. And hundreds of school children attended a press conference in the main hall to talk with some of the cast members. I first read the book when I got it. So I was 34 years old when I read the book. While others enjoyed tours and information and opportunities that went around the building and enjoyed lectures with the Kimmel staff like Carol Frazier. She is the manager of education and she told Yanina how you can get your children involved. So how do you get the kids to come in to the Kimmel Center and to get involved in the programs? Well, a teacher or parents or community group leaders can go to the Kimmel Center website, www.kimmelcenter.org slash education, and there they will find all of our programs and what we have to offer. And the one thing I do want to point out is that most of our programs are free, and we do send in school buses so that the children can come here, which makes it a lot easier for groups to come to the Kimmel Center. And I think it's really good because, you know, they took a lot of the um, arts and performing arts out of the schools. And now we have a place that's offering it to the kids. And that's one of the reasons why we want to be accessible to the communities, especially to the school district of Philadelphia. And we've partnered very strongly with them because we know that there's a deficit now in the arts program. And Kimmel is doing all it can do to make sure that the kids don't lose that opportunity. I think you guys are doing a good job. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Look at me. Hey. Raymond, look at mommy. Maybe the light hurts his eyes. Maybe she's just not hungry. Maybe he can't hear us. 
Maybe we're not stimulating him enough. Maybe it's a phase. Avoiding eye contact is one early sign of autism. Learn the others today. The sooner it's diagnosed, the better. You know, folks, there's been so much talk about mesothelioma. It's hard to pronounce, but very dangerous to our health. Please listen up. Good morning. My name is Mary Hesdorfer, and I'm the executive director of the Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation. I'm a nurse practitioner by training with many years experience in treating patients with malignant mesothelioma. Uh, I'd like to start off by telling you a little bit about the disease um, and some of the challenges we face. Uh, mesothelioma is a disease, uh, is a cancer. It affects the lining of the chest, the lining of the abdomen. It can also affect the lining of the heart. In most cases, mesothelioma can be traced back to exposure to asbestos. Unfortunately, um, it's a 20 to 50 year latency. And what I mean by that is that you may have been exposed 20 to 50 years ago before the onset of symptoms appear. So oftentimes you may not even recall that you had an incidental exposure. Uh, asbestos is found everywhere. It's in government buildings, it's in schools, it's in hospitals, it's in homes. Um, many of us have been exposed to uh, asbestos and then few of us develop the disease. Uh, in the year 2004, our first important treatment for mesothelioma was, uh, was accepted by the FDA. It's a combination of drugs called Olympta and Cisplatinum. About 40% of patients who are given this, uh, it's given this chemotherapy respond. The problem is that patients do not stay in that response. So the hunt is on now to see if we can make the response better and if we can prolong that response. So we have a number of clinical trials now that are being offered to patients. Uh, and you know, we use the term clinical trial, but I'd like you to think of it more as cutting edge treatments. Treatments that are available um, for those people who would like to see if they can do better than what they can currently get out of this standard of care. Now the Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation, part of our mission is that we fund research. So we've funded up to date $8.7 million in research. And what did that research do? It laid the foundation. It, it taught scientists more about the disease. It now has interested pharmaceutical companies to invest in mesothelioma because they now understand a little bit more about the biology of the disease. We're discovering what they call druggable targets. So in other words, areas that could be um, of drug development that they can look at a, uh, a patient's tumor and say, we have a drug on our shelf that will target a particular protein or a particular, um, you know, uh, a particular cell type of your mesothelioma. Uh, mesothelioma before used to be a death sentence, but today there are many people who are living with this disease. But what a really good, I mean, a really good point and a really good message to take home is that when you're diagnosed with cancer, your first, your first thought is, my God, I've got to do something quickly. And what I would like you to do is take a step back, call us, go onto our website, educate yourself. Let us talk to you about all the different clinical trial and all the standard therapies that are available to you so that when you're ready to make a decision, you know that um, you've got the information at hand, you know a little bit more about the language, and you really, you know, and, and you're ready to, to make some of those really informed decisions. So again, um, Feel free to call to contact the foundation at www.curemiso.org or to call me personally and let's discuss your cancer, let's discuss your insurance, let's discuss ways to get you to a specialist. We would like to make sure that you are a successful patient with a good outcome from this disease. Thank you. Wherever the wind blows that's where I'm gonna go Wherever it takes me That's where I wanna be Got to be Maybe he's really focused. Hey, Michael. Michael. Maybe he likes spinning the wheels. Maybe he just loves trucks.
Maybe he's just being a boy. Preoccupation with objects is one early sign of autism. Learn the others today. The sooner it's diagnosed, the better. Well, Dennis Jackson, our man with State Farm, has always shared some very important information about insurance. But during the holidays, he represented his agency at a fundraiser for CASA, an agency which looks after neglected and abused children. As a State Farm agent, part of our platform is to be a part of the community, assisting not only just selling insurance, but any way that you can help the community to advance their causes, charitable organizations. And so that drew me to uh, CASA. Uh, youth advocates, you know, to be a volunteer to help out on their um, board of directors. And primarily our job is to raise money uh, for the organization so that our volunteers might be able to assist the neglected and abused children in Delaware County. And you're a part of it. Yes, and I'm part of it. As although my office is located in Northeast Philadelphia, but I'm also, I live in Delaware County. So a lot of my family and friends uh, are affected by, you know, some of the conditions in the community or Chester or the surrounding Delaware County area. So it just gives me a pleasure having come from there to know what's going on with the young people and how this organization can be of a great help uh, to the city and to Delaware County. CASA stands for Court Appointed Special Advocates. And the best way to describe a CASA volunteer is that that volunteer is a champion for children. That volunteer champions the needs of each child that they're assigned to throughout the dependency system, which is the foster care system. Are all these foster children, or do they have ailments and just, you know, different ailments and things like that? Well, in a, all of them are what we call adjudicated dependent, which means that a court has decided that intervention is needed to make sure that they're safe and that they have an appropriate home, that, that um, something that has happened in their home where their parents are determined to be unfit. Um, it's a, a negative word, but the court determines the parents are not able to parent. And so, yes, they're all, they're all in need of court supervision. Some of them do stay at home, um, and we hope that we never have to put them in foster care, but most of them are in foster homes. What area do you reach with this help? We serve Delaware and Chester counties, primarily Delaware County children, uh, but we recently, in 2015, opened a small program in Chester County as well. Thank you. Now, we also talked to the guest speaker at the same event who told us about her book and some little-known American history. The lady standing next to me, this beautiful young lady, <laughs> and the book she's holding, she's the author of Orphan Train, and that's kind of a tricky name. What does it mean exactly? So Orphan Trains ran in... America over 75 years, taking children from the East Coast to the Midwest in a labor program. A quarter of a million children were transported on these trains and uh, sent to families to be a workforce. Oh my. Slavery. It started during slavery. It started during the Civil War. And in fact, there were no African Americans on the train because the man who started the trains was an abolitionist and he was afraid that the African-American children would be enslaved. The non-African-American children were indentured until the age of 18 or 21. Well, now you're kind of young. How did you discover all this? I am not young, first of all, but thank you. <laughs> um, I discovered it because my husband's grandfather was orphaned and sent on one of these trains. Um, and there was a newspaper article about him that we discovered after he died. He and his siblings were all orphaned and sent on a train, and there was an article about the orphan trains, and I'd never heard of it. So I realized it was a really interesting story, and I now know that there are over four million descendants of these orphan train riders. How does, uh, not only does the book make awareness of what you're telling me about, but how reading it and how getting it involved in this committee today or tonight, how does that help? So I'm really involved in some foster care organizations because 
um, as I was researching the book and I learned what it was like for children in the 1900s, I also created a character in the present day who is in foster care. So I did a lot of research. I used to teach in a prison, a women's prison. Um, my, I have two grandparents who were orphaned and had a difficult time. So I have all these different elements in my past that I think led me to this activism of uh, being involved mm -hmm. in CASA and being involved in some other foster care organizations. You come from England. How did you get all involved in this in America? Well, I was born in England and lived there for nine years, off and on. But my parents are American, and they actually grew up in the South, and they were very active in the 60s in all kind, all the movements that we know about, you know, uh, the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement and uh, eventually the women's movement. Mm. And so I grew up in an activist home where they believed in taking action. And so I think I was very influenced by them. Your book is now on sale. Yes. And we can get it anywhere. That is true. It has sold two and a half million copies. I think a lot of people have discovered this topic, this yeah, story, good. who didn't know it before. And I think they realize that it's a little known part of American history that is very important. Christina Baker Klein. That's her name. This is her book. Don't forget it. Hunger affects nearly 900,000 people in the Delaware Valley. The number of people right here in our community, especially children and the elderly, who aren't sure where their next meal is coming from is unsettling. But there's something we can do to help. At City Team, we believe in helping people who have fallen on hard times. And we believe there's a way to help people respectfully preserving their dignity. What began in 1989 as a once weekly community meal is now a full kitchen, serving three meals a day, every day of the year. In 2013, we converted our traditional food pantry to create a grocery store style experience, offering fresh produce and full choice options for our households in need of food. In 2015, we launched a new project called Hope Cafe. Each Saturday at City Team, our cafeteria becomes a restaurant experience for the hungry, offering a menu with multiple entree options. Volunteers serve as the wait staff and kitchen helpers. After dinner, all are welcome to stay for a time of music and teaching that gives our guests an opportunity to engage with God in their own way. With each bit of growth, we have remained true to our purpose of serving the way Jesus did, filled with compassion, serving humbly, and giving opportunity to share hope with people in the midst of painful circumstances. And we depend on people like you to donate, volunteer, and help change the lives of people known as the Three Degrees go back a couple of decades in our local history, but who have managed to stay on top of their game even with changes in ages and personalities and singers. But one mainstay, Helen Scott, has kept the group together and we can still enjoy the Three Degrees when they come home occasionally from their European engagement. I caught up with them early last year. Where have you been? <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. Wow, where haven't we been recently? 
<laughs> we've been to Japan, we've been to England, we've been to Belgium. California, mm -hmm. we've been to Las Vegas, Vegas. we've yeah. been to Belgium, yeah. Holland. And we're on our way back to the United Kingdom on uh, Sunday. We've got a, a tour going on there for a, a few days. And then what? Uh, then we're off for about three weeks and we're off to Japan after that. Okay. We'll be there from the end of November. Through Why Japan. Europe? Why Europe? It, they're such a, a gracious audience. Um, and we fi I find that, that they don't require that you have a recent hit. They remember the ones that you did have. They remember your performances. So therefore, they liked, they like that. We kind of dug our fingers into them years ago. Yes. And we've been holding on to them and them us for many, many years. So it's it's like our second home. There's a new girl on the block. I think in Yes. I think in Europe they just really appreciate the, the, the wonderful history to the, the history of our music. Okay, well it's good to have you. Any records out? We're working on it. <laughs> if we could just get the time, Trudy, to, to just sit for a second and, and be able to get into the studio because the people that we have that we'd like to use as producers, when we're available, they're not. And when they're available, we're not. So we just have to find just the right time and, and for, for both parties. And always, the you, you, uh, ladies of our, our generation, uh, <laughs> like you that. have to be particular, you know, about your lyrics. What you say? Um, we're we're not bootylicious or any. We are not shaking no. anything and, and or kissing anything. So we we want to make sure that what we're singing, we're we're not embarrassed to sing. So the time to record and the material to record is it's probably what's keeping us at bay. Yes. Well, you look good and you sound good. Thank, well, thank, thank you. you. Well, we'll see you next time. Have a blessed day.